Um, our second speaker on this panel um, is uh, His Excellency David Commission. It gives me great pleasure to, to introduce him because he's also giving uh, a longer talk as a keynote for this event. Ambassador David is a political activist, former head of the Barbadian government's Commission for Pan-African Affairs, and is currently the Barbados Ambassador to the Caribbean Community, or CARICOM, the Association for Caribbean States, and is a member of the Barbados National Task Force on Reparations. So David, uh, if you could unmute yourself and over to you, please. Thank you, Jessica. Um, good day, brothers and sisters. Let me begin by thanking the University of Bristol, its Center for Black Humanities, and its Migration Mobilities Research Institute. I would also like to thank Caribbean Labor Solidarity and its president, Brother Luke Daniels, for recommending me to give this talk. I can assure you that it gives me great pleasure to, to be able to engage in this sharing of ideas at this seminal moment in our global movement for reparative justice. Now, I am speaking to you from the offices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bridgetown, the capital city of the Caribbean island of Barbados. And I am guessing that uh, many persons in the audience would be somewhat aware of the pivotal role played by Barbados in general, but by the city of Bridgetown in particular in the transatlantic traffic of enslaved Africans, in the development of the system of plantation slavery and in the making of the British Empire. In fact, there's a very interesting book titled 10 Cities That Made an Empire. It is written by Tristram Hunt, the director of the Victoria and Albert Museums and a former British member of parliament. In that book, the author lists 10 cities that played critical roles in the construction of the British Empire. And the second city on that list is the city of Bridgetown. The list actually begins with Boston. And Bridgetown is quite fittingly on that list because it was in the then British colony of Barbados that in the 1640s, the British establishment first developed and perfected a plantation-based production system for the generation of super abundant profits on the basis of the super exploitation of labor, black or African labor. Indeed, Barbados holds the ignoble distinction of being the world's first out and out slave society. Not merely a society that possessed slaves or of which slavery was a feature, but a totally new phenomenon in human history, a socioeconomic formation that was entirely dependent on slavery for all of its operations, for its dominant ideology and defining functions, including its very means of sustainability. <laughs> Never before had mankind seen a society constructed totally, completely on the basis of human slavery. That was a new conception created by Britain in 1640s Barbados, and thence from Barbados, the model was transported to Jamaica, Antigua, to St. Kitts, and ultimately to the then 13 North American colonies. It is important that we recognize that these British slave plantations 
of the 17th century were the world's first concentration camps, places in which the sons and daughters of Africa were subjected to the most compressed and extreme terroristic barbarism. So the concept of the concentration camp does not originate with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis of 1930s Germany. Rather, that concept had its genesis in black slave societies like Barbados and Jamaica hundreds of years before. And then, of course, there's the question of the wealth generated for the British Empire. The truth of the matter is that the genesis of the British and wider European industrial revolution can be traced right back to mid 17th century Barbados. Indeed, the combined sugar plantation, windmill, and boiling house in 1640s Barbados was the beginning of the British Industrial Revolution. There were no factories in Britain in the 1640s. The beginnings of industrial production were to be found right there in these Caribbean slave colonies. There was a sugar plantation to grow the canes, the windmill to grind the sugar cane to produce cane juice, and the boiling house to put the cane juice through various heating and chemical processes to, pr to produce sugar and rum and molasses. That was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And by the way, it was all run by enslaved Black or African labor. Not only the so-called field slaves, but also the blacksmith, the boiler, the carpenter, the cooper, the wheelwright, all enslaved African labor. And partly because the commodity of sugar in the 17th and 18th century was akin to a modern day narcotic drug back then, I mean, this, this sweet thing called sugar was, was um, totally new um, to the European palate. Um, it was akin to a, a modern day narcotic drug and the whole enterprise produced massive profits and created Britain's first billionaire class. The distinguished Caribbean historian, Dr. Eric Williams, author of Capitalism and Slavery, had the following to say about the importance of the little 166 square mile sugar colony of Barbados to Britain at the turn of the 18th century. And I quote, he said, Barbados was the single most important colony in the British empire, worth almost as much in its total trade as the two tobacco colonies of Virginia and Maryland combined. The tiny sugar island was more valuable to Britain than Carolina, New England, New York, and Pennsylvania together in the fort. And so we can understand why Tristram Hunt has Bridgetown at number two on the list of his 10 cities that made the British Empire. After Bridgetown, the list goes on to Dublin, Cape Town, Calcutta, Hong Kong, Bombay, Melbourne, New Delhi, and ends with Liverpool. But you know, as I carried out my preparations for this talk, it occurred to me that Mr. Hunt could really have extended his list and added the city of Bristol. And I say this because I have learned that Bristol was deeply involved in the British transatlantic traffic of enslaved Africans. I have learned that it is estimated that over 500,000 enslaved Africans were traded by Bristol merchants. I also learned 
that Bristol's Society of Merchant Venturers, an organization of elite merchants, played a key role in breaking the Royal African Company's monopoly over Britain's transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans, and that thereafter, between 1725 and 1740, Bristol became one of the world's biggest centers of the criminal enterprise known as the transatlantic slave trade, generating enormous wealth for the British Empire, and that this continued right into the 19th century. And so, if Bridgetown and Bristol shared that 18th century imperial history, it is not surprising that they also shared the phenomenon of public statues celebrating heroes of empire and slavery. And I speak most famously of, first of all, in Bridgetown, the statue of Lord Horatio Nelson, the British admiral, um, defender of the slave trade and of slavery, four of William Wilberforce, um, and arch imperialist, um, the, the, the admiral who did much to help construct that British empire. The planter class in Barbados erected a statue to Lord Nelson in 1813 and placed it in the very center of Bridgetown, right outside our parliament buildings. And of course, in Bristol, the statue of the infamous Edward Colston, the Bristol-born slave trader and member of both the Royal African Company and the Merchant Venturers Society of Bristol. And that statue was erected in 1895. And Bristol and Bridgetown, it must be said, also share a common record of taking down these statues. And in the same year to boot, the year 2020, Bristol led the way for us in Barbados. You took down Edward Colston's statue on the 7th of June in 2020 and dumped it in the Bristol Harbor. We took down the statue of Lord Nelson on the 16th of November, 2020, and it is now stored in a warehouse of the Barbados Defense Force. Ultimately, it will end up somewhere in the, in the Barbados Museum. And we all know the circumstances in which these statues were taken down. Um, pivotal to it all was the public lynching of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement that that um, catalyzed. And we in the Caribbean saw the images in Bristol of the demonstrators, the Black Lives Matter demonstrators, physically taking down the statue and dumping it into the Bristol Harbor. In Barbados, um, the Black Lives Matter movement did manifest itself in public marches and, and, and calls, public calls by those marches for the taking down of the Nelson statue. But the difference is that in Barbados, those activists and demonstrators were actually pushing an open door. Um, the, the government was um, very amenable to the idea that the, that the statue um, had no place um, in, the, in its, its location, that Barbados had no interest in celebrating Lord Nelson. Um, and even the elite private sector of Barbados, the Barbados um, Private Sector Association, the organization that represents the Barbados Chamber of Industry and Commerce, 
and the Bankers Association and those elite um, private sector bodies, they too um, approved the idea that the statue needed to be moved, that it had no place um, in, in a location that suggested we were celebrating Lord Nelson and all that he stood for. So I think this is perhaps of all the, the movings, the taken downs of statues that have occurred um, between 2020 and, and 2021, perhaps the case of the Nelson statue in Barbados is unique in that there was no bitterness, there was no divisiveness. It was the Barbadian people and their government acting together to take down the statue. And how, and you may ask, was Barbados able to achieve that almost singular feat of the government and people, including both the activist community and the elite business establishment acting together to remove a 207 year old statue. And I must tell you, um, in the past, um, calls to remove that statue were rebuffed. There was much opposition to the idea. But over the past 20 years in Barbados, there has been a very determined effort to educate our Barbadian people about uh, our history. Um, in 1998, we established 10 national heroes, beginning with General Bassa, the hero of the great um, Barbadian slave rebellion of 1816. Incidentally, that rebellion took place exactly three years after the planter class put up the Nelson, the Nelson statue. And, um, and so, and, and the Bassa statue in Barbados, we have some, we have that very striking Bassa statue celebrating um, resistance to hero, resistance to slavery, celebrating that resistance tradition. So I think that effort, that 20 year effort has gone a long way in opening the eyes and the consciousness of the Barbadian people. But another important element is tied up with the CARICOM reparations campaign and the degree to which Barbados, the country that has lead responsibility within the Caribbean community for the CARICOM reparations campaign, the extent to which Barbados has committed itself to the reparations cause. So let me tell you a little bit about the CARICOM reparations campaign. First of all, everyone, everyone hopefully knows CARICOM or the Caribbean community is a grouping of 15 um, Caribbean nation states, Jamaica, Barbados, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Haiti, um, all, all of the familiar names, Grenada, St. Kitts, etc. In and, and in 2013, the heads of government of our Caribbean community came together in a heads of government meeting and decided that we were going to pursue a claim for reparations for native genocide, for the genocide of the 15 million indigenous people um, whom the Europeans came and found inhabiting our Caribbean islands back in the uh, 15th and 16th century, and also for African enslavement. And, um, and so 2013, our governments decided that we were going to go on that campaign and establish institutions to carry through that campaign. I should say that to some extent, we were taking some inspiration for what, from what the African continent had done back in the 19, early 1990s when um, Chief Moshud Abiola of Nigeria and um, Ambassador Dudley Thompson of Jamaica had held the first international conference 
on reparations in Lagos, Nigeria in 1990. The Organization of African Unity had followed up in 1993 with the first Pan-African Conference on Reparations in Abuja, Nigeria, issued the Abuja Declaration and established the group of eminent persons on, on reparations. So that was some early inspiration for us. But by the turn of the century, the Organization of African Unity was phased out and replaced by the African Union. And unfortunately, the African Union did not replicate um, those OAU reparations initiatives. So the Caribbean, in a sense, took up the ball in 2013 um, and established this campaign. All CARICOM countries were required to set up national reparations commissions. The chair of each individual country national reparations commission, all the chairs were brought together in a regional CARICOM reparations commission headed by Sir Hilary Beckles, the vice chancellor of our University of the West Indies. And over that structure, we established a prime ministerial subcommittee on reparations consisting of six heads of government and chaired by the prime minister of Barbados. Um, very early on, the CARICOM reparations commission developed a 10 point plan for reparations. Um, a, a 10 point demand that was directed at the governments of Western Europe who were involved in the colonial domination of the Caribbean and in organized slavery and slave trade. And that 10 point plan, I'll go through it very quickly. The first point calls for a formal apology from the governments of the relevant European nations. And of course, the government represents the institutional linkage between the present and the past, the institutional continuity between this present era and those centuries of enslavement and colonization. Number two, a voluntary repatriation program for those citizens of the Caribbean, African Caribbean people who are interested in physically returning to the continent of Africa. Number three, an indigenous people development program. Number four, a program to establish relevant and needed cultural institutions in the Caribbean. Number five, a program to deal with the Caribbean's public health crisis, and there's a serious public health crisis centered around such non-communicable diseases as diabetes and hypertension, conditions that can be traced right back to those centuries of, of, of compressed terror and malnourishment on the plantations. Number six, an education development program in the Caribbean. Seven, an African knowledge program for people of the Caribbean component of the diaspora. Eight, a systematic effort at psychological rehabilitation and healing from the traumas of the centuries of genocide and enslavement. Well, that particular item is one for us, not for, not for the Western countries. That is for us to do for ourselves. Number nine, a technology transfer program. Number 10, a process of debt cancellation of the national debts of CARICOM member states. So that was the initial 10 point program that or 10 point demand that was directed at the relevant um, Western European governments. Subsequently, in October of 2017, the CARICOM Reparations Commission added the additional three demands. One, the establishment of a Caribbean Sustainability Fund to be financed by relevant European nations or governments. Secondly, that Caribbean governments be called upon to remove from places of public celebration 
all monuments and statues of historical personalities who were implicated in the crime of enslavement, persons who either committed or facilitated the crimes against humanity of native genocide or African enslavement, personalities such as Christopher Columbus, Horatio Nelson, and Francis Drake. And finally, that October 12th, the day on which Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean in the year 1492 and commenced the African Holocaust and commenced actually both the African Holocaust and the Holocaust of native genocide, but that, that day be designated Caribbean Holocaust Day. So you can see from the, the 10 point plan that um, when we think of reparations in the Caribbean, we don't, we don't simply think of a cash payment. Yes, money is a part of it. Um, there must be capital transfers to help finance our development, but we don't think of it as an, as an individual cash payment. We are more thinking about development. We are more thinking that as a result of those, those centuries of plunder, and looting of making generations of our ancestors work for nothing on the plantations of the Caribbean, in, in, in siphoning off the fruits of their labor. The fruits of their labor did not go to develop our own families, our own institutions, our own um, nations. The fruits of that labor were siphoned off to develop British and European families, and companies and institutions and universities, and ultimately um, Britain and Europe itself. And if we are to repair, as a result of that history, we, we, the nations, the African and African descended nations that were subjected to those, pro those processes of looting and plunder, we now possess a fundamental right to development. And um, these European nations that purchase their development at the price of our underdevelopment are now under a duty um, to engage with us to fac help facilitate our right to development. And I must tell you that um, the CARICOM, after formulating that 10 point plan, CARICOM wrote to the seven leading um, colonizing nations of Western Europe, uh, including, of course, the United Kingdom. Um, in fact, by a letter dated 18th January 2016, our CARICOM heads of government wrote to the then UK Prime Minister David Cameron informing him about the reparations claim against the UK, telling him about the CARICOM 10-point plan, and requesting a meeting during the first half of 2016 to discuss the matter. Well, uh, Mr. Cameron responded on the, by letter, dated the 22nd of April, 2016, and I'll just read you a little bit of what Mr. Cameron had to say, and I quote, um, slavery was and remains abhorrent, and the UK deplores the human suffering caused by both slavery and the wider slave trade. These are among the most dishonorable chapters in the history of humanity, and the UK regrets and condemns the iniquities of the historic slave trade. In respect of reparations, I recognize that regional governments and CARICOM, of course, remain seized of the issue. As you know, the matter was discussed with then Foreign Secretary William Hague during the UK Caribbean Ministerial Forum in 2014, when he made it clear that the British government does not believe that reparations are the answer. 
we should always remember the human cost of the transatlantic slave trade and do everything we can to ensure such horrors are never repeated. But I believe that in today's world, we need to concentrate on building for the future and identifying ways we can work together to tackle the shared global challenges that face our countries in the 21st century. End of quote. So basically, well, we regret this um, awful episode in, in um, human history, but that's a thing of the past. Let's put it behind us and let's move on. <laughs> Let's put it behind us and move on. And um, and that has been the, the, the that has been typical of all of the responses from the heads of government of Western Europe. So we understand that there is a struggle ahead of us. That um, the, these governments are not simply going to admit the righteousness and justice of, of our cause and do what is right, that it is going to require a campaign, a struggle. It is going to require mobilizing our forces to achieve that righteous outcome. Now, let us consider um, ever since those cathartic statue moving events in Bristol and Barbados in 2020, what developments have subsequently taken place in both cities? I, I took a look at um, what has happened in Bristol since the Colston statue uh, was removed. I noted that in September 2020, um, Bristol established the We Are Bristol History Commission, the mayor established it. Um, to consider what should be the future of the Colson statue, but also to help Bristol come to terms with its history of involvement in slavery and slave trade. I also noted that um, Bristol's example of removing the statue seemed to have sparked um, similar taking down, takings down of statues in other parts of the country. It also seemed to have sparked a movement across Britain to reform the curriculum of many schools to include um, uh, 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 the achievements of, of black and minority ethnic communities and to address the harmful legacy of colonialism. I must tell you that similarly, um, that is happening in Barbados. I, over the past year, um, I have been a member of a curriculum development program of the Barbados Ministry of, of Education, where we have developed uh, a, a history curriculum for primary schools and for the first, th the first three forms in the secondary system and um, looking at our history. And I can tell you that um, in the new curriculum, the new history curriculum, the very last topic that primary school children will, will deal with before transitioning to secondary schools is reparations. So reparations is, will be on the primary school um, curriculum. Um, I also noted that not only did Bristol take down a statue, but it also followed up on the 4th of October, 2021 by putting up um, a statue, a statue of Henrietta Lacks at the University of, of Bristol. Um, that um, unique uh, African-American woman whose genes, whose um, genetic material has, has, has been the foundation of so many advances in medical sciences. And, I, and similarly in Barbados, um, very soon after the Nelson statue came down, a statue of Sir Wesley Hall, the great um, Barbadian and Caribbean fast bowler um, was, was, was erected. I, I must tell you, we now have, we have six statues, public statues in Barbados and one bus. 
and all of them of, of um, historical personalities who took forward the struggle of our people, labor leaders, um, slavery resistance leaders, um, leaders of our independence. And, and yes, and that is, that is as it should be. Those are the historical personalities we should be celebrating. But um, for me, perhaps most significantly in Bristol was the 2nd of March 2021 motion that was approved by the Bristol City Council calling for the setting up of a parliamentary commission of inquiry to investigate reparations to be paid by the United Kingdom for its role in the transatlantic traffic in enslaved Africans. And I, I, I note that that motion was proposed by the Green Party councillor, um, Sister Cleo Alberta Lake, whom I had the pleasure of meeting virtually um, just a couple, a couple of days, days ago. Um, this, is, um, this is very exciting that such a motion has been passed and I hope it will lead to the setting up of the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry. And I noted in doing my little research, I noted a statement by Councillor um, Cleo Alberta Lake when she said, and I quote, we do not have the answers as to exactly what reparations should look like. That's why we are calling for a process of repair, which hears from many voices in our communities that have been impacted in, in the court. Um, so that's Bristol, that's um, Bristol. Now let's have a quick look at, um, at Barbados. Um, the statue was removed on the 16th of November. Well, the, the major development in Barbados since the removal of the Nelson statue is the confirmation by um, the government of Barbados that Barbados will be becoming a republic on the 30th of November of 2021 in uh, less than two months time. We will be removing the Queen of England from her current position as um, head of state of, of Barbados. And we will be elevating one of our very own um, to that position of, of head of state. Um, symbolically very, very important. And um, so that, that was one. But also the other good news is that on the 9th of February, 2021, um, CARICOM's Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations held its first meeting under the chairmanship of our relatively new um, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, our first female Prime Minister. And the subcommittee refined and recalibrated the focus and agenda of the CARICOM reparations campaign. And um, that, new, that new thinking was subsequently confirmed by a meeting of all of the heads of government on the 25th of February. And I, I just want to share with you quickly um, what is some of the new thinking. Well, first of all, um, CARICOM has decided that the next phase in our reparations campaign is a very deliberate and conscious outreach to the continent of Africa. We are inviting the governments of the African nations and governments of the African Union to get on board with us in this reparations campaign. Remember I said, we took some initial inspiration from Africa. Well, the circle has, we have, we have come full circle and we are inviting our African comrades to get on board with us. Let us pursue reparations as a, as a joint Africa-Caribbean um, enterprise. And, and I, I can tell you that uh, much has been done on, in that direction so far. In fact, on the 7th of September of this year, a few weeks ago, we held the first Africa-Caricom Heads of Government Summit. Um, in addition, 
our Prime Minister Motley has written to all of the, formally written to the African heads of government, formally in, inviting them to be part of our reparations commission, of our reparations campaign, sorry. And um, we have proposed that um, coming out of that first Africa CARICOM summit, that annually on every 7th of September, we will have an Africa CARICOM summit, a meeting of our, of our heads of government. And we are proposing that the very next meeting should be dedicated, should be focused, if not singularly, certainly primarily on the issue of reparations. Um, from the CARICOM perspective, we have always made it clear that our approach, our preferred approach to reparations is to sit down around a negotiating table with the governments of the relevant European countries to negotiate a package of developmental programs, capital transfers, and debt cancellations that would deliver some semblance of long overdue justice to our people, and that it is only if such a conciliatory approach is perversely rejected by the relevant European nations that the option of international litigation will be pursued. Um, so, but, so we are very clear that what needs to happen first of all is to develop a movement, to develop a mass movement, first of all, in the Caribbean, on the continent of Africa, but also an international mass movement in support of reparations. I like to say that we must make the, we must make the demand for reparations into an international cause celeb. We must develop an international mass movement similar in scope and power to the anti-apartheid movement of the 1970s and 1980s. We must develop a movement that is so powerful and so widespread that wherever the representatives of these um, relevant European nations go, um, people of goodwill all over the world are saying to them, but well, what about the debt you owe? Um, to, 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 the, to the nations and people of Africa and the Caribbean. When are you going to honor that debt? And, and so we must look for allies. We, have, we are asking Africa to join us, but we must look for allies all over the world, including in the relevant European um, um, countries. So we must look for people of goodwill and good conscience. Um, we must look to the, the, the labor movement. We must look to um, universities, um, student movements, women movements, the church, uh, religious leaders, people of good conscience and, uh, and, and of goodwill and people who recognize um, and are committed to, to justice. And we must build that international um, movement. And, um, and, and, and let me now just give you some so let me now encapsulate um, some of the fundamental components of our new thrust for reparations. So I've, also, I've already told you about the 10-point plan and how that demand is directed at the governments. Well, we have I'm very sorry to interrupt, um, but we do need to move on to our uh, next... Oh, sorry. Okay, but if you have any final saying, statement to make, that would be yeah, good. Yeah, let me just end by saying that um, that basically um, four crowns, we, we, are, we are looking at the, the governments, but we are also looking at all of the private sector institutions, universities, companies um, that, have, that were implicated, that, were, uh, that benefited. And um, the idea is to set up an international reparations fund into which those institutions will be asked to make, to make payments. Thirdly, we are recognizing more and more that the 
currently existing international economic and political order has its roots in those centuries of colonization and enslavement. And to a large extent, African and Caribbean nations and people have been inserted into that system in a structurally subordinate and exploitative manner. And therefore, we have to commit ourselves to a reparative restructuring of the international economic and political order and the institutions of that order. And finally, um, reparations is also about repairing any psychological and cultural damage that 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 we that that we still have that but that must be our own mission um, we must engage in those cultural and psychological self repairs so i just want to end by saying that um i you know um i think bristol is well on its way and 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 um, cleo cleo lake has outlined the right approach for devising what reparations would look like for, for Bristol. In the Caribbean, we ours is a different reality, but perhaps some of the things that we are pursuing could give some insight and some ideas to the Bristol process. But I want to end by saying that ultimately um, we must work together. It is one reparations movement, different parts, but all interconnected. And we must therefore find ways of working together to establish this global movement, and we must do it together. Thank you very much.